Welcome back to Citizens Forum. My name is Will Smith. I'd like to thank the Shaw staff and our wonderful volunteer staff also for all their work in making this production every other week. Today my guest is Mary Coyle, and Mary is a local author, and she has written a new book called Slow Boat to Paris, and I'll just hold it up here and uh, put the cover up so you can see it. So welcome to the show, Mary, and how did you... How did you uh, get started to think of, think of writing this book? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, I guess uh, my husband and I had a story to tell. And the story is about an old Dutch sailing barge that we bought and uh, have been using now for the past 10 years in the heart of France. Ten and, years. Uh, 10 years, yeah. And uh, it's had its ups and downs for sure, so the story isn't all smooth sailing. <laughs> we took on water at one point and almost sank, and we lived in a shipyard, a very tiny shipyard in the heart of France for two and a half months, Where? repairing the boat. It's in a tiny place called Marseille des Aubignes. It's not really on the map. It's oh, so it's tiny. Not. Yes. But is yeah. it on a river or a canal? It's, it's on a. It's on the canal. It's on the canal right beside the Loire River because the canal. Uh, uh, some of the canal system uh, dovetails with the. Uh, or I shouldn't say dovetails. The, the Loire River goes beside it, and the two have quite a symbiotic relationship. The canal and the river. So yes. is the are the canals still used for commercial? Yes. Yeah, they are. Not where we are. Uh, we're uh, moored right now in the heart of France, but certainly up north when we've been up that part of uh, France, you see a lot of, um, a lot of traffic on the canals. It's really an environmental way to move things. So we see um, huge canal barges with uh, loads of grain and uh, wood from forestry. They have forestry there too. Now, do the, do the barges go uh, with animals pulling them? Is that how they used to do it and now That's they do it with they motors? That's how they used to do it, okay. yes. In fact, actually, an old Dutch sailing barge like ours used to have sails on it and a full oh, rigging. Really? Yeah. How and then, uh, I guess in the 1940s, 1950s, um, there was a move to uh, retrofit the barges with tractor engines and other uh, okay. things. But no, you're right. Horses used to pull them and women used to pull them. I've even oh. seen the special harnesses made for women and every oh so often uh, uh, there are a few jokes in the port amongst the barge community about <laughs> <I think we'll laughs> women being those. put to work. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, so yeah. let me get this straight. So you live in Victoria. Yes. And yes. you've lived here for a long time. I lived here since I was six. Since you were six, yes. okay. Well, that is a long but time. But <laughs> ten years ago, yes. you and your husband just decided yes. to get we, this yes. barge in yes. France yes. and live there for half of the year. Yes, we live there for about four months of the year now. Four yes. months, okay. Yeah. Well, that just sounds so fun. Yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> and so this book is telling of about your various adventures before and during that time or yeah really you know the book is divided in three parts the first part of it is the dream of buying the boat oh, okay. and then um, the second part's the reality of boat ownership <laughs> <laughs> I'd never had a boat before and so for me that was a steep learning curve and then the third part of it is all about uh, my reflections really about living in rural France and contrasting that with uh, being here in Canada and what the people are like and uh, it's really a bit like going back in time because uh -huh. um, the people there are really so friendly and, uh, and, and so lovely and they have uh, a much slower way of living. That which, sounds which delightful. We enjoy. Yeah. So one of the things that you're going to be doing uh, on, on Monday, if that's right, is you're yeah. giving a presentation that's right. on this book, right? Are you reading? Yeah. Are you going to read from it? Yes, or? it's just a, the, just a social, a social, a social event okay. with the uh, Odd Fellows Hall. At the Odd Fellows Hall? Yes, that's right. And what right. time is it? It's at 7.30, but I think people probably want to get there about 7 o'clock and mingle and and. Uh, and it's open socialize. to the public, right? It's so open anybody, to the public. Anybody, anybody who's can interested come. in this can yes. come and hear about it yeah. and hear you yeah. read. And then also, it seems to me that I've sort of been hearing about this in the background, that, yeah. that you're also going to bring um, something, right? Uh, yes, I'm going to make my homemade scones. Homemade yes. scones with <laughs> right. strawberries, is that right? Uh, I think it's raspberry juice. Raspberries, yes. okay. Yeah. yeah. I just want to make sure I get all this straight. Yeah, that's right. That's an important so, part. <laughs> so if you do want to come yeah. to this, you need to RSVP because she has to know how many scones yes, to how make. how many make. So. That's right, yeah. Okay, and then... Uh, 
you're involved in another. This is a. This is also to raise money. It's free. It's a free event. Yes, that's but right. But you can make donations. Yes. And yeah. and and uh, I believe that your book. You're donating all the proceeds I from do. the book. Yes, okay, that's so right. Okay, so tell us about what yeah. it's going for. Well, you know, really. Um, uh, my sole motivation in writing the book uh, was that I felt that there was a story, but also I wanted to raise funds for animal um, welfare. And so just before Christmas, I had a fundraiser selling the book for the Mexcan uh, uh, Pet Partners Dog Rescue that's run by Marlene Davis, who's a wonderful woman here in Victoria. Uh -huh. She lives in Fernwood, um, bought a condominium down in Guanajuato, Mexico, and was upset with the state of the dogs there. In fact, actually, to be blunt, they are putting down 50 dogs a week. That's 200 uh, a month. Wow. And uh, she's done the best that she can to form a shelter and she has up to 40 dogs in it. And uh, she arranges for them to be brought up to Victoria and uh, where they find great homes. And so I've got one of them, wow. a lovely little dog called Dolce. And uh, my mom has one as well. So she's somebody who's very well worth supporting. And uh, then- now, I just want to ask you a question yeah. about that. So you mean you actually take dogs from Mexico and mm -hmm. bring them here? Marlene and, does it. Yes. And it's not it's not uh, not a big problem to no uh, she has a really good system in place there are a number of agencies doing this kind of thing uh, because there's a tremendous need but Marlene does all the paperwork that's required so wow. for example they have to have rabies shots so Dolce came to me as she was a friend who brought Dolce up uh, friends Ted and Alan a wonderful couple who have a place in Puerto Vallarta and so they um, offered to bring Dolce to me in the cabin of the plane because she's small enough that she can fit in under the seat in front of us. And uh, there are people actually who do dog runs like that. But wow. there are some un there are some really great airlines uh, who, if, which if they have uh, space in their holds, will allow people, rescue groups, to put dogs in to come up to places where they can find homes. And the dogs yes. seem to be just fine speaking English and French? Oh, just kidding, I, just kidding. I think Dolce speaks Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> right. yes. Okay, and then yeah. I think you have one other uh, yes, organization. I do. Another so. organization that I'm, I'm a part of is called the Canadian Animal Assistance Team. And uh, that's a wonderful organization which tackles a very different problem, but it's all intertwined around uh, animals in need, dogs and cats in need. And uh, that's the one of uh, overpopulation. And so uh, CAT, uh, Canadian Animal Assistance Team, that's what, it's, what it stands for. It sounds like it's just for cats, but it's actually dogs and cats. Okay. And um, what the philosophy behind that group is, is to go into um, First Nations communities in Canada. There are also uh, clinics in other parts of the world too, but basically in Canada to go into First Nations communities at their request to host free vaccine spay and neuter clinics for dogs and mm -hmm. cats. And it's a wonderful event. I've been on several of them. And uh, it's a whole team, a veterinarian goes in with uh, vet techs and people like myself who don't have veterinary expertise, but I get the great job often of doing the admissions at the front desk and meeting oh, nice. the people. And it's a really nice exchange because we go in on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and you know there can be as many as 60 animals spayed and neutered, and they get other um, medical attention as well, time permitting. And um, we're hosted by the First Nations community, and uh, they often put on a feast, uh, say on a Saturday night. And uh, some of the best uh, interaction that happens with the local community is in the um, uh, community hall kitchen. You know, oh, where that's great. and that like everybody fun. gets to talk about the animals and and caring for them, and it's it's very rewarding for everybody. Now, yeah. how long have you been doing this the cat work? I've been involved in for about four or five years now. Yes, and the Mexcan. Uh, only since we got Dolce, they have a wonderful website, by the way. Um, okay, Marlene let's put that does. Up. What is the uh, URL? It's this. It's Mex M E X hyphen C A N uh, Pet Partner Dog Rescue. Okay, I'll put and, that. I'll put oh, that. Oh, great! Up on thank the you. And, and you know, people can look through that, and there's some of the most gorgeous dogs there, all of whom need homes. And is yeah. there a, is there a uh, a website for the cat? Yes, it's just uh, C A A T. 
Uh, dot I guess, ca. Dot CA. Or, okay, yes. we'll, look, we'll put sure that up too, so people can yeah. visit it if they want to. Right. Yes. You okay. Know. Now, so obviously, organizations like this always need money, but do they need yes. volunteers also? Or yes, if you become a member of CAT and you want to go on a clinic, there's a whole application process where you can apply and and go out on the clinics, and that's what I've been able to do, which has been great. Yeah. So yes. this might this might be a good way for someone who doesn't doesn't necessarily know what it's like in the First Nations communities yes, to, yeah. if, they ha if they're interested in this, they could volunteer and get involved yes, in that yes, yeah. and be welcomed. Okay. Yeah, I actually started that. It started um, being a part of CAT with a good friend of mine, Karen Dellert, and we were walking along Dallas Road with our dogs and we were saying, well, we're both retired. What can we do? You know, what, what is something that we feel passionate about and how can we give back? And we thought, well, we both feel really passionate about dogs and cats, and um, this might be something that would be really positive to do. Yeah. Sure, that's a that's a positive thing yeah. for our community. Well, that's great. I, I uh, have some experience with pets myself, and uh, I have to say that the rescue animals that I've had, the, the rescue dogs, have just been, I mean, <laughs> for one thing, you don't have to go through the pain of raising a puppy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. So, yeah. So uh, having a rescue yeah. animal, they're typically very, I, what I found is that the rescue animals I've had, they go through a period where they're just sort of wondering what's going to happen yeah. to them now. Yeah. And then they get to this point where they're sort of, you can tell that they're grateful, that they're, that they're very happy to that be with, happy. with you. Yes, yeah. Uh, and, some and of them have been abused or they've just yeah. been not, uh, you know, we can imagine if they live out, if they're street animals, that yeah. they don't have a good life. So, well, that's very yeah, interesting. Yeah, there's nothing more rewarding um, than as a retired person who's around the house quite a bit, um, than to have an animal who has been abused, who just needs that extra bit of help to get better. And so I have two dogs. Dolce is the one from Mexico, and she's a real little character, and I don't think that she has been abused, although she was physically very badly neglected because she was uh -huh. quite emaciated. Uh -huh. But then my other little dog, who was brought up by Fiona Monitz, who's another wonderful person in Victoria who does dog rescue, and she does it through, um, I, I don't know that she's still doing it, but she was doing it. Uh, eight years ago, or four years ago, sorry, through the um, uh, Los Angeles High Kill Shelters. And so I've got a former puppy mill dog, likely, and uh, she has kennel syndrome, and she's come along tremendously, and she's just a lovely little dog. Okay, I got two, I have yeah. two questions from that. So what is the something kill? What, high some, kill shelters. High yeah. kill shelter, what's that? Well, it's Is that a shelter like where they come like and they kill them? Yeah, well, no, it, it means that the dog generally has about a week to find a home. Oh. And if the dog doesn't find a home in a week, it is killed. And uh, uh, Saga, my little dog, was one of uh, five little dogs who were on a list that Fiona saw that were going to be killed that day. And so I guess rescue groups can say, no, we'll take those dogs. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, right. So, yes, it's horrible to think of my dog and what could have happened to her if... Fiona hadn't saved her. Well, sometimes yeah. I wonder, uh, I don't know about this, but I, I think you're illuminating this area. You know, if you go to some countries, there are dogs mm -hmm. and cats running all over the place. And yes, then yeah. if you go to other places, there aren't any. And it yeah. just depends on how, like in Malta, there are sort mm -hmm. of, uh, there are cats all over the place yeah. and nobody would think Rome. of touching yeah. them. But mm -hmm. in here, do we have a problem with that? I mean, do we kill a lot of animals in Canada? Uh. Not so many. Gosh, you know, that's a really loaded question, isn't it? There are all kinds of bad things that happen to animals here in Canada, not least of which are the animals that are killed for food. Oh, um, wow. I'm vegetarian myself. <laughs> so, you know, okay. the transport of animals is pretty grim. So we don't have a very good record. We, we maybe have things uh, under control with regard to dogs here in Victoria. I think cats are more of a problem, oh, yeah. but certainly um, we have a more hidden issue, and that is the processing of uh, animals for meat. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. Thank yep. you so much, Mary, for being yep. on the show and telling well, us about this. Thank you very much and for it, having me. And if you do yep. want to hear about this more, you can, you're welcome to come to um, Oddfellows Hall. I'll put up a screen with this on, information on it. And you're welcome to hear about Mary's book and the, and the other things that she's doing. So thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.
Our friends know how much Malk, my husband, loves France, that wonderful mecca of bread, cheese, and wine. Yet never in my wildest dreams would I have thought we'd be living on a Dutch sailing barge only three hours by train from Paris, or that I'd be so sorely tested. The French economy is suffering, yet there's one area in which France still appears to lead the world. I'm talking, of course, about adultery, the ultimate betrayal. Surely no other language has a special phrase, le saint cassette, for an affair that takes place between leaving work and coming home? We all know that the French are notorious for turning a blind eye to mistresses. Yet having Marc expect me to do so was not something I'd bargained for. Marc constantly referring to another woman as gorgeous, graceful and lovely has been more than difficult. His disappearances for weeks to be with her are trying and emotionally testing. It's impossible to compete with this mistress, who's definitely a cougar. She's over ninety years old, for God's sake. Mark's other woman, Noit Vollmacht, is an elegant classic sailing barge, and she resides in a pied à l'eau with stunning views in the heart of France. Trust me, I've learned why boats are usually referred to as she, something I had always been vaguely curious about. Maybe one of the reasons is that men have lovingly designed, built, and taken care of them. Throughout the ages, seafarers have sailed the ocean wide in their nautical escorts, often in a symbiotic, lifelong relationship. They've explored afar with their wood, iron, steel, and fiberglass companions, and shared many an adventure in good times, as well as bad. Men decorated ships of old with colorful, buxom figureheads, adorned with flowing manes that proudly parted the ocean at the bow. By far the majority of boats have female names. No one seems to know why or how the tradition of treating boats as women began. Maybe it's because in ancient times boats were dedicated to goddesses, and later to important women such as queens. Were boats named after women to encourage respect from their male crew, motivating them to cherish their vessels and handle them with the utmost of care? Or did early seafarers view their boats like mothers, depending on them for survival, rocked to sleep at night, embraced below deck in a maternal womb, safe from the elements? It's even been suggested that the origin of a girl in every port refers to the many ships in mariners' lives. And there are the more facetious explanations such as you have to treat a boat like a lady, or she'll act up and cause havoc. And the quip that, like a woman, they take a lot of powder and paint to keep them looking good. Living with the elegant, unique Noit Vollmacht certainly looks and feels like I'm coexisting with Mach's mistress. The first words he greets me with in the morning are often, Ah, what a wonderful night! I dreamt about Noit Vollmacht again. He openly and unabashedly tells me that he loves her. Before we bought her a brand new John Deere motor, he confided, You know, when I go into the wheelhouse first thing, I talk to her and her aging engine, offering soothing words of encouragement. Mark buys her expensive jewelry, brass fittings, antique light fixtures, and fancy ship's clocks. Sometimes he even uses my charge card, the ultimate betrayal. He frequently urges me to buy her gifts, saying, Wouldn't Noit Vollmacht look marvelous wearing that? He has her installed in one of the best canal ports in France. She's a demanding mistress, so classically beautiful, that she could hardly be expected to receive anything less than la crème de la crème. Her wants, needs, and demands are endless. Marc frets about her, fusses over her, and even buys her flowers. He admires her and loves to take photos of her position just so. He's constantly concerned about not letting her down, and he ruminates endlessly about taking off with her to exotic places. He paints her trim with glossy paint in a luscious lipstick red, just the right shade that he had the nerve to get me to choose. Mark caresses her woodwork when he thinks I'm not looking. He gently swaddles his sleeping beauty in tarpaulins as he puts her to rest for the winter, and murmurs sweet nothings to her in the wheelhouse. As if this weren't enough, 
he opens up his laptop daily to a stunning photograph of her. There's no doubt that he has come to know how hard a taskmaster his mistress can be. Take the time she was lifted into a dry dock to have her hull refurbished. The shipyard folks broke the news to Malk that the love of his life's hull was in dire need of a complete makeover. Eight steel plates were welded to her underside, a complex, time-consuming, and outrageously expensive proposition. As Malk loves to tell everyone, the cost of her bottom lift should have included a surgical lift for both our bottoms, too. Well, for mine at least, he's hasty to add, as I'm sure Mary's derriere is already perfect. Marc does, after all, know what side his bread's buttered on. So let me tell you how Marc and his French mistress came about, and how I've come to be part of our ménage à trois.